Welcome to ETF Market Insights. I'm Erin Allen, VP of Online ETF Distribution with BMO ETFs. And today I'm excited to be joined by a very special guest, Kathy Wood. Kathy's the founder of ARK Invest, which many of you will be familiar with. But for those of you who aren't, ARK is an active investment manager who's focused solely on disruptive innovations. ARK has over 23 billion in AUM and it has a focus on long-term innovations in their five chosen themes of technological innovations. Those five themes are robotics, artificial intelligence, energy storage, DNA sequencing, and blockchain technology. BMO has partnered with ARK to bring their three flagship ETFs to Canada, ARKK, ARKG, and ARKW, where they'll trade in Canadian dollars under the same tickers on the Canadian exchange. These ETFs have a lower correlation to traditional growth and, and value strategies with little overlap with indexes like the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, which makes them a great complement or satellite in a portfolio, especially for Canadian portfolios where there's typically a home bias and they're underweight tech. ARC's approach is what I like to refer to as higher risk, higher potential for rewards. So while these are more volatile stocks, as we've seen in particular this year, these disruptive innovation themes are expected to change the very way we live. You know, if I consider a time before computers, before the internet, I think it's safe to say that we'd all be a little lost right now. I should say a lot lost. And Kathy's really uncovering the next generation of these innovations that will forever shape our lives. Welcome, Kathy. Welcome to Canada. I am so happy to be here. It's in great to have Very you here. Time. We're really Thanks. excited about this partnership. Yes. And I'm looking forward to getting into our discussion today. Yeah. Uh, so we'll jump right into it. Okay. Can you give us sort of an overview of the three ETFs that we're bringing to Canada? Yes. So um, the two more specialized ones are ARKW, the Next Generation Internet, and ARKG, which is really the genomic revolution. ARKK is a broader based innovation fund. Uh, that incorporates ideas, best ideas from both ARKW and ARKG, but other ideas from uh, other portfolios, more specialized portfolios in the firm. Uh, and so it incorporates innovation on, uh, from the five major platforms around which we have centered our research and investing. Again, exclusive focus on disruptive innovation. Those five platforms are uh, DNA sequencing, which we call multiomics now because sequencing is not just DNA, it's RNA and proteins. Uh, so it's getting more and more interesting. Uh, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology. And the other thing that we see going on is the convergence between and among these platforms. And so K, ARKK, captures those. Uh, and the others touch uh, the convergences as well. Right. And when it comes to your innovation, innovative approach and your approach to uncovering these next gen innovations, can you walk us through your approach and what makes it so unique in the marketplace? Yes. Uh, our starting point is very unique. Uh, we do start from the top down uh, and, and basically ask ourselves, uh, what is an autonomous vehicle going to be? What's going to go inside it? Yeah. So we're asking, this is first principles research. We're trying to figure this out. And as we do, um, we are sharing our research uh, with the world uh, through many social platforms. Now, why do we do that? Uh, we do that because we're trying to become, well, engage with and become a part of the communities we're researching. And uh, the communities are very interested in our research because we are sizing the opportunities they're going after. And they're usually mass market opportunities. So they're very big. And they're also exponential growth opportunities. So consistent growth in, in these platforms uh, from a sales or revenue point of view, 25% plus over many, many years. Uh, and so there's a good give and take between the community and ARC. So that's our starting point. Uh, and the screen for our research is not any benchmark. Uh, 
-hmm. Benchmarks are more backwards looking. Uh, we're looking to the future. And uh, so the screen is our research. Once a stock comes in, a company, and then a stock comes into our, our uh, perspective, uh, we then start researching the, the, the company from the bottom up, revenue, gross margins, uh, cash flow, and so forth. Uh, and we are as stock research driven as any other portfolio team you'll find out there, but our time horizon is different. We have a five-year investment time horizon. Uh, these days, the time horizons have shortened in this risk-off period to not even this quarter, but last 12 months. Yeah. Again, backwards looking. Uh, so we're very forwards looking, five years. And then we have an overlay uh, after our top-down and bottom-up analysis. The overlay is very specific uh, to innovation. It's a scoring system. Six metrics uh, like uh, management, people, culture, critical. Do we have a visionary team here? Uh, moats or barriers to entry. Uh, do they have uh, some technology that's going to be very difficult for others to duplicate for some reason? Um, we've got product and service leadership. So that's market share. That's very quantitative uh, out there. Uh, we have execution, but in our world, execution is not, did they make uh, the operating margin to the tenth of, uh, tenth of a decimal point that the street expected? That's not the way we think. We're, we're thinking about these companies in terms of, are they investing enough in R&D? And if they are, are they investing in the right places in terms of R&D. So we're very focused on that. And in fact, we want our companies to be investing aggressively now right. in order to capitalize on these massive opportunities. And then just two more metrics. One is valuation. Uh, and that one uh, comes out under a lot of scrutiny, uh, mostly because of the time horizon difference uh, uh, compared to other strategies. Uh, we make the assumption that our companies are sacrificing profitability now and investing in order to capitalize on these opportunities. And we want them to, because many of them are winner take most opportunities. And uh, so we are assuming that our valuations are going to diminish over time. Right. So if you look at e, if you look at enterprise value to EBITDA, you'll see our portfolio, our, our flagship portfolio, close to 60. And the market is in the 14, 15 range. We're assuming over the next five years that 60 goes down towards very close to the market multiple. Uh, and so we have a lot of conservative assumptions in terms of valuation built into our models because our companies, even in five years, are not going to be as mature as the market is today. Okay, I love it. Thank you for walking us through. It's such a unique approach, and I love how unconstrained the mandates are yes. by yes. you know size, geography, sector, you name it. Like or you benchmark. Uh, yeah. You know, our our objective, uh, and and we put our valuation um, uh, exercise through this objective, is to deliver a minimum hurdle rate of return of 15% at a compound annual rate during the next five years. Uh, so we are not looking at a benchmark as our guide. We're looking at the performance of these companies as our guide, their potential. Mm -hmm. Great. And then you talk a lot about your five chosen themes within technological innovation, and you often talk about how they're converging and evolving all at the same time. Can you expand on that a bit? Sure. I think this is what a lot of traditional uh, analysis is missing, uh, because, uh, because most traditional asset management firms are not set up the way we are. Uh, we have broken our analyst responsibilities out, not by sector, uh, or industry or multi-industry, we have broken them out by technology. Our analysts are technology specialists and they are sector and industry generalists. Why? Uh, because these opportunities and, and platforms are converging and creating mass market opportunities as costs associated with each of the technologies come down. Mm -hmm. 
And, and so a, a really good example of convergence here in, um, in the, is the autonomous taxi platform. Uh, that incorporates three of our platforms, robotics, autonomous vehicles, our robots. Mm -hmm. uh, energy storage, they will be electric. Electric uh, cars today are, are, are less expensive on a total cost of ownership basis than gas-powered cars. And they will be powered by artificial intelligence. Now, each of these platforms has an S-curve associated with it. So what we're describing here are S-curves feeding S-curves feeding S-curves. And we think creating explosive growth, one of the biggest opportunities in the world today, investment opportunities, um, is the autonomous taxi platform. We think uh, the revenues today are de minimis. Uh, we think they will be up to nine to ten trillion dollars in the next eight to ten years. The U.S. economy is roughly twenty-one trillion, so that helps uh, put that in perspective. Mm -hmm. It's a massive opportunity, and in fact, if you look at the impact on GDP of this opportunity compared to most of the major innovation platforms in history, this is bigger than all of them combined. Mm -hmm. So it's a very big opportunity. There's one other uh, example. It's in the genomic space. Uh, and so we've got the convergence of sequencing, now DNA, RNA, protein, mm -hmm. um, with artificial intelligence, so now that we understand the mutations in our six billion bits of code in our bodies, uh, what's going haywire, uh, we understand that because of sequencing, we can now train the data with artificial intelligence mm -hmm. uh, to, figure out, um, to figure out what diseases each person individually is predisposed towards. And as we age, uh, we develop more mutations. They're programming errors. Uh, and uh, sequencing our genomes uh, is going to, to, to find those errors. And then the, the third leg of this school, so uh, stool, so DNA sequencing, artificial intelligence, is gene editing. Once we find the programming errors, we are now beginning to edit them out. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is already curing uh, beta thalassemia, uh, sickle cell disease, ATTR, wow. and uh, CRISPR therapeutics, which is uh, one of the stocks in, in both ARKG and ARKK, um, has uh, focused on diabetes as one of its next big areas uh, to apply gene editing. And uh, CRISPR therapeutics is run by a scientist who's also a really good businessman. And if he thinks uh, this target is going to work, then I agree. Yeah, great, that's amazing. And obviously we've seen a bit of a pullback in a lot of the names this year. It's been a really hard year with mm -hmm. inflation and rising rates. Mm -hmm. Have you done anything different in the management of the portfolio or has it changed your views in that sense? Well, um, so what we typically do during a risk off period, and for us, it actually started in February of 21, when fears of inflation and interest rates started to increase. And uh, what we always do during a risk-off period is concentrate our holdings towards our highest conviction names. Mm -hmm. So we've spent the last year and a half doing that. Uh, and our flagship strategy has come down in terms of number of names from 58 to the low 30s. Uh, so we've taken a lot of stocks out of the portfolio. And what does that mean? We use that metric scoring system to say, okay, where are our highest convictions? And why not concentrate now? Because traditional asset managers are diversifying right. and uh, moving back to their benchmarks by selling our stocks. And so we're getting bargain basement prices. Uh, so that's the reason for the concentration over time. Now, in terms of the inflation and interest rate issue, um, we have watched supply chain issues coming out of COVID, extreme supply chain issues. And then on top of that, uh, it, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So another set of supply chain problems and supply shocks. So we're looking at the last two years in terms of inflation picking up as a function of supply shocks. 
And there are two reasons that we believe inflation not only is going to come down, but is going to transition into deflation. These supply shocks are being cured by demand destruction. We have a Fed that has increased interest rates in the United States 16-fold from the lows. This has never happened. Even in the early 80s, when Fed Chairman Volcker was strangling inflation, uh, interest rates went up twofold. Now, it was 10 to 20 percent, but the impact of 16-fold should be more severe than the impact of twofold. Mm -hmm. So demand destruction, we think we're in a recession, global recession, uh, that will that will help. And then, of course, with prices moving up, supply has moved up. That's an invitation for more supply. And we saw companies double and triple uh, and quadruple ordering because they were afraid they were going to lose sales. And now they're stuck with this huge inventory overhang. How are they going to clear that? That's going to be discounting this holiday season. So we think we're going to see deflation uh, for those reasons demand destruction, supply increasing. And then the third very important reason to us uh, that will sustain this sort of deflationary undercurrent in the economy is inflation. Mm -hmm. But that deflation is good deflation. When prices come down in new technologies, demand booms. And so you'll have that um, the kind of confusion uh, old economy versus new economy during the next year. Mm -hmm. And we think that will accrue to our benefit along with inflation coming down dramatically and interest rates following. So it sounds like this must be, you know, becoming to be an attractive entry point potentially to a lot of these innovations. Well, 18 months, uh, I've never been through anything like this in my career. And, uh, and we've never seen a 16-fold in, in interest rate increase either. And uh, the scenario I just described should be very productive for our strategies. For sure. And at BMO, of course, we've been really focused on broad market passive exposures. I think this is a great new solution to add to our lineup. Yes. Um, but how do you see it fitting within a portfolio from an allocation perspective, or how does it work within a portfolio? It depends now. Uh, obviously, advisors are, are understand the risks their clients, the risk appetite of their clients. But broadly here, um, if we're right that these five innovation platforms are going to disturb the traditional world order, which is represented by the benchmarks, then for no other reason, even if these strategies seem volatile, you should have a hedge in your portfolios, uh, you know, in the, in the form of a disruptive innovation strategy. We see what's happening, uh, not just to autos. The auto sector is being upended by electric and soon autonomous. But even companies that uh, many people thought were the innovative companies out there and had reached the top of these benchmarks, many of the FANGs, for example, mm -hmm they are being disrupted uh, by some of our companies. So we're a good hedge a against that disruption. That's, that's the first thing. Uh, and so is that 5 or 10% of uh, a portfolio allocation? I don't know. Um, but it would be in that range. Mm -hmm. We have done a white paper. It's on our site. And if you look at uh, combining our strategy with other more benchmark strategies, growth, value, and then our strategy and throw in their emerging markets as well. Uh, what you'll find is that including our strategy over the long term will increase returns per unit of risk taken. Okay. Uh, so I, I think from that point of view, the 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 um, client who is interested in the new world and has more of an appetite for risk, especially with uh, so many of the stocks in the innovation space being crushed here, mm -hmm. um, I would be um, I would go higher than that five to ten percent, and our paper would suggest the same. 
Okay, yeah, and I think for Canadian investors, this is just such, such a great solution because we're so underweight tech and so many Canadian investors have such a home bias, too much tech, too much financials, too much energy in their portfolios. So it is a great compliment too. It, it's a great pair trade yeah. actually. It's a little bit of a barbell strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's very good. Mm -hmm. uh, and Canada isn't alone. In fact, most investors in the United States are short innovation right. uh, and, and they don't know it. But mm -hmm. the reason we've had great asset retention is those who do, who are feeling the ground shift underneath them because of innovation, know that they don't have enough exposure in their portfolios. And so they've been averaging down in this environment, which mm -hmm. I think will work out well. And ARC has been so transparent in your approach, which is very unusual in the active management space and unique. And um, I think it's great how much research you guys provide on your website in terms of all of the different innovations. But why did you decide to, to go with such a transparent approach to management? Yes, when I started in the business, which was the late 70s when I was in college, information was really hard to get. I mean, I remember calling the government and spending three hours trying to get one data point. That, that, that was crazy. No computers, no cell phones. Yeah. Uh, today, information is ubiquitous. It's how you put it together. And we also know, especially after 08, 09, uh, how much more transparency investors want. Mm -hmm. And uh, we feel that um, by providing our research and educating our clients, um, what we're doing is helping them to get on the right side of change, not just with their portfolios, mm -hmm. uh, but with their lives, you know, in terms of guiding their children or grandchildren, you know, get on the right side of change. Mm -hmm. This is where the world is going. Read this research. Um, and we, one of the reasons we did it is we feel like we're filling an unmet need in the marketplace. There is not, as I mentioned before, uh, not enough in, uh, uh, investment in innovation. And uh, we want to advertise uh, or, or promote how provocative uh, these five innovation platforms are going to be in terms of generating returns and changing lives in the future. So just to to give you a sense of how, how big the opportunity is. And so this is not just in terms of market cap out there, but in terms of careers um, and, and, and the benefits of getting on the right side of change. We believe that in the global equity markets today, innovation is priced, so the market cap, is at roughly $7 trillion, less than 10% of the global public equity market cap. We believe that seven is going to 210 trillion within the next decade, and will account for more than 50% of the broad-based uh, benchmarks. So it's going to become even more important over time to get on the right side of change yeah. if you want to enjoy investment returns but also career success. And I think people are grateful. Um, the other reason we are transparent, we give our research away, not when it's finished, but as it's evolving. Right. And why do we do that? We do that because we want to battle test our ideas. And we are engaging with the communities we're researching. And so they appreciate what we're doing in terms of sizing the markets, understanding the unit economics, understanding the competitive dynamics, and they want to help us. And so we are getting back so much more than I ever expected from people in the industry saying, hey, you might want to think about this, or you might want to think about that, or professors in universities who are doing research in graduate schools. Um, we've actually helped some of them with their research papers, and they've helped surface some um, mistaken assumptions in our work as well. So battle testing assumptions when it comes to exponential growth trajectories, really important. We don't want to make an exponential mistake. Yeah, that's <clears throat> great. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. It was great to chat with you today. I'm really excited about our partnership because I feel like our companies are on the same page in so many ways in terms of transparency, education, and of course, innovation. Innovation. Right? And, and we have been so impressed 
with uh, BMO's um, efficiency and organization and creativity um, every step of the way. It's, it's an incredible partnership and, and we couldn't be more delighted. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to having you back on Market Insights again Looking soon. forward to joining you again, Erin. Thank you. Kevin.